call this meeting to order. Uh, is the mic on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, heads of state and government. Last year, uh, here at the United Nations, I called on the world to unite against the evil that is ISIL or Daesh and to eradicate the scourge of violent extremism. And I challenged countries to return to the General Assembly this year with concrete steps that we can take together. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's here today, uh, including my fellow leaders, for answering this call. We are joined by representatives from more than 100 nations, more than 20 multilateral institutions, some 120 civil society groups from around the world, and partners from the private sector. I believe what we have here today is the emergence of a global movement that is united by the mission of degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL. Together, we're pursuing a comprehensive strategy that is informed by our success over many years in crippling the Al-Qaeda core in the tribal regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we are harnessing all of our tools, military, intelligence, economic, development, and the strength of our communities. Now, I have repeatedly said that our approach will take time. Uh, this is not an easy task. Uh, we have uh, uh, ISIL taking root in areas that uh, already are suffering from uh, failed governance in some cases, uh, in some cases civil war or sectarian strife. Uh, and as a consequence of the vacuum that exists in many of these areas, ISIL has been able to dig in. Uh, they've shown themselves to be resilient, and they are very effective through social media and have been able to attract adherents, not just from the areas in which they operate, but in many of our own countries. There are going to be successes, and there are going to be setbacks. Uh, this is not uh, a conventional battle. This is a long-term campaign, uh, not only against this particular network, but against its ideology. And so with the few minutes I have, I want to provide a brief overview of where we stand currently. Uh, our coalition has grown to some 60 nations, including our Arab partners. Uh, together, we welcome three new countries to our coalition, uh, Nigeria, Tunisia, and Malaysia. Nearly two dozen nations are in some way contributing to the military campaign, and we s salute and are grateful for all the service members from our respective nations who are performing with skill and determination. In Iraq, ISIL continues to hold Mosul, Fallujah, and Ramadi. But Iraqi forces, backed by coalition air power, have liberated towns across Kirkuk province and Tikrit. Uh, ISIL has now lost nearly a third of the populated areas in Iraq that it had controlled. Uh, Eighteen countries are now helping to train and support Iraqi forces, including Sunni volunteers who want to push ISIL out of their communities. And Prime Minister Abadi, I want to note the enormous sacrifices being made by Iraqi forces and the Iraqi people in this fight every day. In Syria, which has obviously been a topic of significant discussion uh, during the course of this General Assembly, we have seen support from Turkey that has allowed us to intensify our air campaign there. Uh, ISIL has been pushed back from large sections of northeastern Syria, including the key city of Tal Abyad, putting new pressure on its stronghold of Raqqa. And ISIL has been cut off from almost the entire region bordering Turkey, which is a critical step towards stemming the flow of foreign terrorist fighters. Following the Special Security Council meeting I chaired last year, more than 20 additional countries have passed or strengthened laws to disrupt the flow of foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, we share more information, and we are strengthening border controls. 
We've prevented would-be fighters from reaching the battlefield and returning to threaten our countries. But this remains a very difficult challenge, and today we're going to focus on how we can do more together. In conjunction with this summit, the United States and our partners are also taking new steps to crack down on the illicit finance that ISIL uses to pay its fighters, fund its operations, and launch attacks. Our military and intelligence efforts are not going to succeed alone. They have to be matched by political and economic progress to address the conditions that ISIL has exploited in order to take root. Prime Minister Abadi is taking important steps to build a more inclusive and accountable government while working to stabilize areas taken back from ISIL, and our nations need to help <clears throat> Prime Minister Abadi in these efforts. In Syria, as I said yesterday, defeating ISIL requires, I believe, a new leader and an inclusive government that unites the Syrian people in the fight against terrorist groups. Uh, this is going to be a complex process, and as I've said before, we are prepared to work with all countries, including Russia and Iran, to find a political mechanism in which it is possible to begin a transition process. As ISIL's tentacles reach into other regions, the United States is increasing our counterterrorism cooperation with partners like Tunisia. Uh, we're boosting our support to Nigeria and its neighbors as they push back against Boko Haram which has pledged allegiance to ISIL, and we're creating a new clearinghouse to better coordinate the world's support for countries' counterterrorism programs so that our efforts are as effective as possible. Ultimately, however, uh, it is not going to be enough to defeat ISIL in the battlefield. Uh, we have to prevent it from radicalizing, recruiting, and inspiring others to violence in the first place. And this means defeating their ideology. Ideologies are not defeated with guns, they're defeated by better ideas, a more attractive and compelling vision. Uh, building on our White House summit earlier this year and summits around the world since then, we're moving ahead together in several areas. We're stepping up our efforts to discredit ISIL's propaganda, especially online. The UAE's new messaging hub, the Sawab Center, is exposing ISIL for what it is, which is a band of terrorists that kills innocent Muslim uh, men, women, and children. We're working to lift up the voices of Muslim scholars, clerics, and others, including ISIL defectors, who courageously stand up to ISIL and its warped interpretations of Islam. We recognize that we have to confront the economic grievances that exist in some of the areas that ISIL seeks to exploit. Poverty does not cause terrorism, but as we've seen across the Middle East and North Africa, when people, especially young people, are impoverished and hopeless and feel humiliated by injustice and corruption, that can fuel resentments that terrorists exploit, which is why sustainable development, creating opportunity and dignity, particularly for youth, is part of countering violent extremism. We recognize we also have to address the political grievances that ISIL exploits. Uh, I've said this before, when human rights are denied and citizens have no opportunity to redress redress their grievances peacefully, uh, it feeds terrorist propaganda that justifies violence. Likewise, when political opponents are treated like terrorists and thrown in jail, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the real path to lasting stability and progress is not less democracy. I believe it is more democracy in terms of free speech and freedom of religion, rule of law, strong civil societies. All that has to play a part in countering violent extremism. And finally, we recognize that our best partners in protecting vulnerable people from succumbing to violent extremist ideologies are the communities themselves. Families, friends, neighbors, clerics, faith leaders who love and care for these young people. Remember that violent extremism is not unique to any one faith. So no one should be profiled or targeted simply because of their faith. Yet, we have to recognize that ISIL is targeting Muslim communities around the world, especially individuals who may be disillusioned or confused or wrestling with their identities. And in all of our countries, we have to continue to build true partnerships with Muslim communities based on trust and cooperation so that they can help protect their loved ones from becoming radicalized. And this cannot just be the work of government. It is up to all of us. We have to commit ourselves to build 
diverse, tolerant, inclusive societies that reject anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant bigotry that creates the divisions, the fear, and the resentments upon which extremists can prey. Uh, I'm pleased that here at this summit, businesses, including high-tech companies, are investing funds, training, and technological expertise to support innovative programs that push back on violent extremism. Cities around the world are joining together to build more resilient communities. Researchers are partnering to share best practices, knowing what works and what we can do better. And as we saw yesterday, young people from around the world are participating in their own summit. And these young people, many of them Muslim, are coming together and using their talents and technology to push back on ISIL's propaganda, especially online, and to protect their brothers and sisters from recruitment. Uh, these young people are an inspiration and give us hope. And I'd ask everyone to join me in thanking all the young people who are here today. <clears throat> so to conclude, we face a grave challenge. Uh, we have to be clear-eyed about the fact that this is very hard work. Uh, we have individuals uh, here like Prime Minister Abadi uh, and uh, President Buhari who are on the front lines. Uh, and uh, this is not going to be turned around overnight because it is not just a military campaign that we are involved in. Uh, there are profound changes taking place in the Middle East and North Africa. There are problems that have built up over decades that are expressing themselves and manifesting themselves in organizations like ISIL. Even if we were to wipe out the entire cadre of ISIL leadership, we would still have some of these forces at work. But ultimately, I am optimistic. In Iraq and in Syria, ISIL is surrounded by communities, countries, and a broad international coalition committed to its destruction. We've seen that ISIL can be defeated on the battlefield, where there is sound organization and a government and military that is coordinating with this coalition and with our diplomatic efforts. And here at this summit, we're seeing a new global movement to counter the violent extremism that ISIL needs to survive. Like terrorists and tyrants throughout history, ISIL will eventually lose because it has nothing to offer but suffering and death. Uh, and when you look at the reports of those who are uh, laboring under their uh, control, uh, it is a stark and brutal life uh, that does not appeal to people over the long term. Uh, so we will ultimately prevail because we are guided by a stronger, better vision a commitment to the security, opportunity, and dignity, dignity of every human being. Uh, but it will require diligence, focus, and sustained effort by all of us. Uh, and I am grateful that all of you uh, who are already participating uh, are committed uh, to this work. And with that, I want to give the floor to our Secretary General, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency President Obama, for your strong leadership and very inspiring and visionary uh, statement today. And I'd like to also thank you for hosting this very important uh, leaders' summit uh, this morning after a very successful and meaningful White House summit meeting on countering violent extremism in February in Washington, D.C. Uh, since then, uh, this process has sparked uh, serious uh, conversations around the world to address the menace at its root. Violent extremist groups, including Daesh and Boko Haram, pose a direct uh, threat to international security, mercilessly target women and girls, and undermine universal values of peace, justice, and human dignity. That threat is growing. Our most recent data shows 
a 70% of increase in foreign terrorist fighters from over 100 countries to regions in conflict. Addressing this challenge goes to the heart of the mission of the United Nations, and it requires a unified response. We know violent extremism flourishes when human rights are violated, aspirations for inclusion are ignored, and too many people, especially the world's young people, with their hopes and dreams lack prospect and meaning in their lives. We also know the crucial ingredients for success. Good governance, the rule of law, open pluralist societies, quality education, and decent jobs, full respect for human rights. Security-focused counterterrorism measures are crucial. Yet we can no longer have such efforts backfire by playing into the hands of those we are seeking to defeat or by further alienating already marginalized groups or communities. The United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy, the Security Council Resolution 2178, provides tools for addressing the scourge of violent extremism, including the growing flow of thousands of foreign terrorist fighters. The duly adopted Sustainable Development Goals also echo the voices of people and critically include a goal of peace, justice, and strong institutions. Our objective must be to go beyond the countering violent extremism to preventing it in the first place. On the basis of an emerging, of an emerging international consensus, I intend to present a comprehensive plan of action to prevent violent extremism early next year to the General Assembly. I hope that each and every member state who are participating in this would closely coordinate to share your experience and your uh, vision, how we can work together to combat and fight this extremism. And we most welcome your suggestions. This plan, which is uh, firmly based on the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy, will provide specific recommendations to member states on individual and collective actions to systematically address the drivers of violent extremism at every level. It will also put forward recommendations on how the UN system can support member states to prevent the violent extremism through an all of UN approach covering the many dimensions of our work. Let me briefly highlight five keys to success. First, governments cannot do it alone. We need to engage all of society, religious leaders, women leaders, leaders in the arts, music, and sports. Second, we need to make a special effort to reach young people where they live, share ideas, and communicate. <laughs> Social media is central. We need to offer a counterweight to the siren songs that promise adventure but deliver horror, and that promise a meaning but create more misery. Third, leaders must work harder to build the truly accountable institutions. I continue to urge leaders to listen very carefully to the grievances and aspirations of their people and address them. Fourth, and fundamentally, we must be guided by the moral compass of our common values. Respect for international law and human rights is non-negotiable. Without it, we are lost. Fifth, and finally, let us not be ruled by fear or provoked by those who strive to <laughs> exploit it. We have a major challenge before us, one that will not disappear overnight, but one that we can address concretely by forging societies of inclusion, ensuring lives of dignity, and pursuing this essential endeavor inspired at all times by the United Nations Charter and Universal Declaration of Human <coughs> Rights. I thank you, and thank you for your commitment. Thank you very much.
Next, uh, I would like to give the floor to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Haider uh, Al Abadi, Prime Minister of the Republic of Iraq. Sayyid Reis Obama, Sayyid Ban Ki Moon, Amin Am, Lil Umma Mutahida, Asada Qadat Al Alam, Mushuubihim, Assalamu Alaikum Jamiyan, Walahmatullahi Wabarakatu. مر أكثر من عام على احتلال داعش لأجزاء كبيرة من أرض العراق وما سببته من مآس وجرائم كبيرة بحق المدنيين وبحق الممتلكات والآثار وأماكن العبادة خلال هذا العام تم تشكيل تحالف دولي للوقوف مع العراق في وجه الإرهاب وهناك دول صديقة كثيرة وقفت مع العراق في حربه العادلة ونحن شاكرون لكل أولئك الذين وقفوا معنا في هذه الحرب ضد عدو مشترك هذا العدو بالتأكيد لا يهدد العراق فحسب بل يهدد المنطقة والعالم أجمع واليوم أيضا تمر سنة على تشكيل الحكومة التي أرأسها هذه الحكومة التي جاءت بعد انتخابات ديمقراطية حرة وفي انتقال سلمي للسلطة هذا التقدم الذي حققناه خلال العام الماضي علينا أن نجني ثماره اليوم خلال هذه العام وخلال الأشهر القادمة ونحن نستطيع أن نجني هذا الثمار بتعاوننا ووقوفنا معا ولكي نتعرف على موقفنا الحالي وتوجهنا الذي نحن ماضون إليه ينبغي أولا أن نتذكر أين كنا عليه خلال العام الماضي أو السنة الماضية قبل تشكيل هذه الحكومة وما ورثناه من بلد يعيش في أزمة كانت داعش تحتل أكثر من ثلاثين بالمئة من الأراضي العراقية في ذلك الوقت كانت قواتنا العسكرية في وضع خطير بسبب انهيارات عدة فرق من الجيش العراقي بعد دخول داعش إلى العراق وكانت هناك أقدم حضارة في العالم مهددة بالزوال ومهددة بالاحتلال من قبل داعش وهي حضارة العراق على الجبهة الداخلية كانت هناك نزاعات خطيرة بين الكتل السياسية وبين القوميات وبين الأقليات انقسامات طائفية وعرقية الحكومة كانت على بشكل ضعيف في ذلك الوقت لدينا أزمة اقتصادية وأزمة مالية بيروقراطية عنيفة وقوية في البلد بالإضافة إلى أعداد كبيرة من المتقاعدين ومن العاطلين عن العمل Mais nous avions une énorme bureaucratie dans le pays et beaucoup de chômeurs chez nous aussi nous avons travaillé Мы сегодня возвращаем Um, personnel who are fighting um, da uh, Daesh with uh, salaries in uh, uh, also for fight uh, for fighting ISIS and we also have cancelled what is more than 50,000 uh, of what is called the uh, elusive um, uh, uh, Soldiers who were just receiving salaries is salaries without really uh, uh, doing any work. This was this way we uh, got our um, budget rid of uh, the burden. We also we're um, also getting rid of um, uh, honor um, posts that and reducing. Um, the um, Iraq's um, dependence on uh, oil uh, income. Uh, and we, uh, and during uh, this, we're trying to uh, get uh, benefit from the reduction of the oil. Uh, we are trying to uh, unify all the um, 
government and the community around it. And our government is seeking forming um, local fighters and um, who are fighting together against terrorism and because ISIS is threatening the whole area, we are working on uh, reinforcing our uh, connection or a relationship including Saudi Ara uh, Iran uh, and Saudi Arabia and all uh, the regions of the area generally. We're also making uh, reforms in uh, the area and in the diplomatic front and we are uh, acquiring um, we are winning during the last year. We have uh, freed Amerli and Marwana and Jurf as sakhr and Zumar and Beji and Jawalla and Sadir and Duluaya and Takrit and Dur and Alam and Hajjaj and a lot of other regions. And in um, freeing Takrit, Takrit, we involved the security forces uh, Ira of Iraqi and uh, the tribal um, forces and the um, uh, community uh, forces also. Tens of thousands of Iraq, Iraqi people are now back in Tikrit. About 80% who uh, flee, uh, who had um, flown before, flow before we came, they came back after uh, a lot of assistance uh, that uh, who are uh, who provided. Um, aid to Iraq uh, through directly or indirectly despite the um, uh, the the retributions uh, were um, low compared to the fears of them where da uh, ISIS was committing um, different kinds of crimes against uh, um, from tribes against the others this way we, there has been retribution and re uh, revenge cases, but it's uh, been limited. That's why we consider it to be um, a victory in all trees, but we still need the aid of the civil uh, international community. Despite the uh, uh, what's going on um, of uh, the, uh, uh, we have three million um, uh, Iraqi who has been, um, out of their places and with the budget of Iraq uh, compared to what have been, we cannot finance all these um, battles that we are seeking to win. We need your help and the help of the international community in financing and the equipment of our soldiers. We need your support in order to also um, uh, take care of the uh, people who lost their loved ones and the children. We need your help to also to dry this, where the um, er radicals and the terrorists are stemming from and their ideologies who are coming from all uh, places in the world and they're coming from the North of America. They're coming from Islamic, uh, Islamic and Arabic countries too. We need to work with uh, our neighboring countries to stop the uh, uh, foreign uh, fight, terrorist fighters who are killing civilians in Iraq and Saudi Arabia and then go back to their countries where they come from after they have done a lot of uh, uh, terrorist um, uh, actions. We want you to stop the terrorists from financing the money through uh, international financial networks that are being used now to finance those terrorists. We are demanding to uh, suspend it uh, under the light of the resolution uh, of the uh, council. We want you to help us uh, stop them from uh, slay enslaving women and uh, men and stealing the um, artifacts and, and because those pe people who have been, her hearts have been filled with, with heart, uh, with hatred, we need to adopt um, the treatment of the um, reasons of those problems, uh, economic and um, political. We have started on doing that um, up till now, uprooting this basic reason that causes people to uh, di be directed towards uh, radicalization and uh, violence and terrorism. We have uh, provided um, different kinds of um, 
sacrifices and our 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 people have uh, are still sacrificing their lives for this purpose we need not to lose focus and not to lo not to lose time in um, uh, enforce enforcing our uh, gathering of our forces against uh, ISIS and do do not forget forget that this uh, the time is a big element uh, uh, together, you have stopped, and we have stopped the uh, uh, march of the terrorists. Together, we will gain a victory that is not uh, only the victory of the Iraqis, but it is a victory for all the representing countries in every country that has contributed with us in fighting the terrorism. Thank you, and for all that we have done and all that we are going to do. Thank you. Shukran ya Sayyid Abadi ala tasrihikum awal amal alladhi tuzawiyunahu tahta tahaddi idhru fi tahaddiyat kabir. In your country. Uh, I want to next uh, give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Muhammadu Buhari, the President of the Federic, uh, Federal Republic of Nigeria. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank President Obama for organizing this important meeting. <clears throat> the timing is appropriate and the subject matter warrants our close attention. The threats posed by ISIL in the Middle East and violent extremism elsewhere are an existential danger to many states. ISIL is a serious threat to international peace and security and should be treated as such. There can be no half measures of expedient solutions in dealing with terrorists and extremists. They respect no laws and have no regard to the sanctity of lives and property. They operate outside law and must be seen for what they are and dealt with appropriately. Given the, the acceptance process for recruits into ranks of ISIL involves rigorous vetting and screening, as well as sponsorship known as Tazkia, our expectation was that the demanding enlistment process, coupled with the legal framework instituted by the United Nations, would stem the tide of their flow. Apparently, this is not yet happening. Mr. Chairman, the increase in violence and terrorism by ISIL and other groups has enticed and emboldened insurgent groups in Africa to pledge allegiance to gain local traction. The Boko Haram terrorist group operates in the Lake Chad Basin area, which is currently on the Al-Qaeda sanctions list, pledge its allegiance to ISIL in March 2015. While we believe that Boko Haram action is an indication of the weakened and operational capacity of the group, it could also suggest that it was a strategic move to attract foreign fighters into its fold and obtain assistance from ISIL. Certainly, whatever the reason was for the declaration of allegiance, one thing is certain. Boko Haram terrorists group wants to be drawn into the center stage of global terrorism. This development has led not only to a shift in strategy, but also to changes in ideology, recruitment, and propaganda method by Boko Haram. It is a cause to mass executions and public beheadings in the style of ISIL became notoriously wide separate after the declaration of allegiance. We also note that Sub-Saharan Africa has been receiving social attention for purposes of radicalization and incitement. In the April 2015 edition of the IS magazine, the, the big entitled Sharia Alone Will Rule Africa, Boko Haram was congratulated for joining the caravan of jihad, saying that they would now guard yet another frontier of Khalifa. Boko Haram is neither protecting nor promoting Islam. Islam is the religion of peace. 
and does not advocate the killing of innocent people. Furthermore, capitalizing on historic ethnic tensions and upheavals in Africa, ISIL is making vigorous recruitment campaigns and strident efforts to expand into some communities into the Sahel region. Indeed, ISIL operations have lent credence to the supposition that terrorism and violent extremism are the two sides of the same coin. Mr. Chairman, Nigeria notes with satisfaction the efforts of the United Nations and the rest of the international community to contain ISIL. We certainly need to do more. We need to take military action combined with effective border security, intelligence collection and sharing, and vigorous policing action. These alone may not suffice, but they can certainly stem the tide and reverse the process of recruitment, movement, and effective operation of foreign terrorist fighters and their associated radical extremists. In order to put in place the critical components of an effective approach to countering ISIL and eventually defeating it, we must address the threat from source. We must find a way to prevent young people from turning to, ter to terror in the first place. And the young people that turn to violent extremism do not exist in a vacuum. They are often part of communities and families and are lured into the fold of barbaric and nihilistic organizations somehow through a misguided appeal to their worst fears, expectations, and afferent frustrations. While addressing the causes of this attraction and how to deal with them, we should pay close attention to other manifest factors that may not be tangible but can be crucial. Good governance, which entails transparency, accountability, and rule of law, remains the basis on which we should kickstart the process of ridding the world of the menace of terrorism and violent extremism. The international community will be required to work together to deter and disrupt illicit financial flows from nations with weak anti-theft structures to other parts of the world. Where such funds are identified, the victim state should be assisted to recover them expeditiously. Mr. Chairman, you have yourself observed that, and I quote, groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIL exploit the anger that festers when people feel that injustice and corruption leave them with no chance of improving their lives, unquote. Mr. Chairman, member states need to address local socio-economic grievances by formulating policies that will ensure broad-based transformation through job creation, equalization of opportunities, and expanding access to social services. We in Africa need also under, uh, rededicate ourselves to uphold the mandate of the African Union Fair Review Mechanism and other good governance initiatives that we have adopted in our region to encourage conformity with political, economic, and corporate governance values. Mr. Chairman, the Secretary General of the United Nations noted in 2015, we are facing, I quote, the greatest test our human family faces in the 21st century, unquote. Thus, all options must be explored <coughs> and all hands must be on deck in the quest for a durable and a lasting penalty to the threat forced by ISIL, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and the like. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Your Excellency, for that uh, statement. And I now give the floor to Her Excellency, uh, Ms. Erna uh, Solberg, uh, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Norway. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to speak about violent extremism. It's one of the greatest security challenges of our time. Violent extremism brings death and suffering to innocent people. It brings destruction and insecurity to whole societies and regions, and it's on the rise worldwide. Our goal must be clear. 
Violent extremism must be defeated. We must work together to combat violent extremism and eradicate its roots. The conditions and attitudes that allow such forces to exist and grow. And each and every one of us can make a difference. We need to mobilize civil society, young people, women, faith leaders, local communities, and governments. We need a concerted effort to prevent and counter violent extremism. Last year, Norway launched our national action plan against radicalization. It involves local communities, civil society organizations, and nine different government departments. The work against radicalization has to transcede silos. Poverty and lack of opportunities are often said to be the root causes of violent extremism. This is a grave oversimplification. It does not su su sufficiently explain the complex range of factors that motivate people to commit terrorist acts. We must, however, recognize that the risk of people being drawn to violent groups increases in areas where there are few other opportunities. This is particularly true for young people. But let me be very clear. There can be no excuses for violent extremist actions. Violent extremism is illegitimate and unacceptable. The perpetrators must always be held accountable. On the 22nd of July 2011, Norway experienced a terrorist attack on the main government building. Later that day, a youth camp at Utøya was brutally attacked. Many young women and men lost their lives. What we saw in the aftermath was an incredible engagement of commitment from our youth across all political dividing lines. We know that there are groups out there who are willing to cynically exploit vulnerable people, particularly young people. Young people must be involved in governance and development of our societies if we want them to prevent them being recruited to violent extremism. This was clearly expressed at the Youth Against Violent Extremism event in, at the European Conference of Countering Violent Extremism in Oslo in June. And it was highlighted once again in the Global Youth Summit in New York yesterday. An independent European youth network against violent extremism was launched in Oslo in June. We hope this will grow into a global network and we hope that you will all find it as a useful partner in developing your own plans to stop violent extremism. Last year, the Security Council adopted uh, Resolution 2178, which calls for the promotion of women's empowerment as part of the work to counter violent extremism. Extremists also know, understand the power of women, so they want them on their side. At the same time, they attack women's rights and silence women who are often an alternative vision of society. But it's exactly these voices that must be heard. Therefore, I warmly welcome and support the new alliance of women's organizations against the violent extremism. But I like to underline, when women raise their voices like this, they are not just heard by the extremists and hit by the extremists, they are often also attacked by more traditional forces in our societies. They will need our backing if they shall do their work against extremism. As new forms of violent extremism emerge, new knowledge is needed. We must improve our ability to share information that we already have, but we also need more research to shed new lights on the local drivers of extremism. It is at the local level that the drivers of violent extremism can be most easily understood. So local communities and authorities have a key role to play. The newly established Strong Cities Network will enable cities across the world to pool their resources, knowledge, and best practices. We must also strengthen international cooperation. Norway has launched a new development aid program to prevent and counter violent extremism. And we welcome the Secretary General's initiative to draw up a new action plan to prevent violent extremism. This will complement Security Council Resolution 2178, which currently underpins international efforts to stem the flow of foreign terrorist fighters. Norway is contributing to all five lines of effort set out by the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL. 
The Norwegian military contingent is now fully deployed in Iraq. We are helping to stem the flow of financial resources and foreign terrorist fighters, working to counter ISIS propaganda and helping to stabilize areas in Iraq. We are also providing humanitarian assistance. So let me round off by quoting Ibrahim Abukar, Abu a, uh, a young Norwegian Somali man who spoke at the youth conference in Oslo. What happens in a small corner of the world will affect us, all of us. So let's start working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, uh, for that excellent statement. Uh, we're now moving to a critical part of our agenda, and that is uh, to hear from uh, a broader uh, group of coalition members uh, in discussing how we can make further progress against uh, ISIL. It's a large and growing global coalition. It stands united around a common mission. Uh, we're going to hear from key members of this coalition uh, about the various efforts and the collective capabilities that we're bringing to bear, from military training and support uh, to our partners on the ground in Iraq and Syria, to denying terrorist access to global financial systems, and working to counter ISIL's message of hate. Uh, as we've indicated before, this is a long-term campaign and requires the kind of cooperation uh, and effort from all of us uh, that uh, will be challenging, but I'm confident that we are up to the task. And uh, I want to begin by giving the floor to His Majesty King Abdullah uh, the second King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Your Majesty. Uh, thank you, President Obama, for your continued leadership and commitment uh, on this issue, which is possibly the greatest collective threat uh, of our time. Last year, I spoke here of the need for a coalition of the determined, and indeed, uh, this has transpired. Our collective resolve uh, resulted in degrading Daesh assets and capabilities over the past year. Importantly, we have succeeded in interrupting Daesh's access to some of its vital financial resources. As a result of our efforts, Daesh's momentum has been weakened. However, our coalition still faces significant challenges. And as uh, Mr. President, uh, you said yesterday, if we cannot work together more effectively, we will all suffer the consequences. We all know the road ahead is long, but we can navigate it by continuing to work collectively, constantly adapting our strategy and upgrading coordination among coalition members. While this coalition is focused on fighting Daesh in Syria and Iraq, a more holistic approach requires a wider perspective and plan to eradicate the threat as well as an inclusive political solution to these conflicts. We must tackle the flow of foreign fighters and Daesh's supply chain across borders more effectively. Empowering local communities in the fight against Daesh and conducting the war in a way that alleviates their suffering is also vital. As I said last year, this is first and foremost our struggle. Muslim nations have to lead this fight to protect and show the true nature of our religion. Again, and as you pointed out, Mr. President, while the battles may be fought on the ground and by the population that is most affected, this war can only be won on the ideological plane. Another challenge we still need to address more effectively is the battleground in cyberspace. We know Daesh is replenishing its ranks by targeting and luring potential members worldwide through social media, and it is still able to fund new recruits' travel to Syria and Iraq. Daesh, as Shabab, Boko Haram, and various terrorist groups that we are looking at are offshoots and franchises of the same threat and are in Sinai, Libya, Yemen, Mali, and now in Afghanistan and elsewhere in Africa and Asia. None of us are safe until we have a path forward that addresses this interconnected reality. 
This is not a single country's problem. It is not a local or regional problem. It is our collective problem. On this front, Jordan has begun a collaborative effort in, uh, to reach out to, as a Muslim and Arab state, to countries in Africa to help uh, coordinate and support with stakeholders and build a partnership to address our interlinked threats. We are certain that there is no alternative to a comprehensive approach and close coordination among all stakeholders that considers the threat of various terrorist groups across the wider region. We hope this will align various programs, counterterrorism, and security assistance efforts under a unified strategy. Finally, we cannot tackle this threat in a vacuum. A world that allows the Palestinian-Israeli conflict to move further away from the two-state solution is a world that fuels extremists' recruitment. Furthermore, the world should not be silent to violations to the sanctity of Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, as this will only empower those who seek to wage a religious war. Winning hearts and minds remains a big challenge, as this will also require, in the longer and medium term, dealing with governance, poverty, youth, job creation, and education. It is only by stabilizing the entire region, giving people hope instead of fear and destruction, that we will truly address these and other challenges, including the outpouring of refugees, many of whom are fleeing from terror and seeking a decent life far from their homes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Your Majesty. Uh, I now give the floor to the Right Honorable Mr. David Cameron, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. David. Mr. President, look, I agree with a lot of what's been said, and I won't repeat every point. You're right, this is a long-term campaign. You're right that ISIL have lost territory. Uh, we will play our part militarily. We've carried out 300 strikes in Iraq. We've trained over 1,000 Iraqi troops. We're going to play a particular role helping with the counter IED part of what's happening in Iraq. And we'll play our part politically. We'll support Prime Minister Abadi with the vital work he's doing. Britain has spent uh, $1.6 billion on supporting uh, Syrians in those refugee camps and in, in Lebanon and in Jordan. And we'll go on doing that because it's so vital as part of this effort. And we'll support the transition in Syria that uh, Barack, you spoke about and that we need to see so badly. We also will play our role in uh, the propaganda war that we need to win because, frankly, we need to call out ISIL for the mass executions, for the rapes, for the killing of innocent uh, Sunni Arabs while they're selling oil and wheat to the Assad regime at the same time. We need to win this propaganda war far more effectively than we have to date. Uh, we're going to be establishing the coalition strategy communication cell in the United Kingdom, which will give some funding of $15 million uh, to start with. And I think it needs to be a very important part to win, as people have said, the battle of hearts and minds um, amongst uh, young Muslims right around the world. But I want to make just one point in my remarks, and it's this, that I think what we're saying about countering violent extremism, uh, I don't think it's enough. I think we need to focus on the extremism that lies behind the violent extremism as well. Why do I say this? Well, I say it because the boy who straps a bomb to his chest and blows up uh, an Iraqi town, the guy that stands in the desert with a knife having just beheaded a British hostage or whoever, they don't get there from a standing start. They have extremist views and an extremist mindset before they make that final decision to be an extremist terrorist. Now, maybe it starts with being told that Christians and Muslims can't live together. Maybe it moves on to being told uh, the Muslims everywhere in the world are under attack, the grievance narrative. Sometimes it's being told that the terrible attack that took place in this city on 9-11 was somehow a Jewish conspiracy. And then it goes on to being told that violence is sometimes justified, that a suicide bomb, if it happens in Israel, well, maybe that's not so bad. And you get an extremist mindset that then moves on to the belief that taking part in violent jihad or joining ISIL or joining 
uh, any of these other franchises, Al-Shabaab or others, is justified. And my point is simply this. We have to stop this process at the start, not at the end. So, of course, we have to win militarily. We have to have the political solution. We need all the propaganda I've spoken about. But we also need to challenge the extremist worldview right at the very start. What does that mean? Well, in Western countries, it means we have to root out the extremist preachers that are poisoning the minds of young Muslims in our country. We have to build more integrated societies so young people feel they truly belong. And we need to make sure we don't allow the incubation of an extremist worldview even before it gets to justifying violence. We've got to get it out of our schools, get it out of our prisons, get it out of our universities. I believe in freedom of speech, but freedom to hate is not the same thing. I think the King of Jordan who just spoke made a very powerful intervention about the special responsibility there is amongst Muslim countries and Muslim leaders. Barak, you said, and you're quite right, that every religion has its extremists. But we have to be frank that the biggest problem we have today is the Islamist extremist violence that has given birth to ISIL, to Al-Shabaab, to Al-Nusra, Al Al-Qaeda, and so many other groups. Now, these people claim to act in the name of the Islamic religion. They don't. I can say they don't. I can say they don't over and over again. You can say they don't, but there's nothing more powerful than what, for instance, the King of Jordan has just said when uh, Muslim leaders and Muslim countries reclaim their religion and explain why what these people are saying is not Islam, it is a perversion of Islam. So we have to do that and to take away the building blocks of extremism that lead people to an extremist worldview that then takes them to an extremist terrorist view. That, I think, is as important as the military, political, diplomatic, and other steps that we'll take as part of this, violent, this vital, vital campaign. Thank you, David. I want to now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Mark Rutte, uh, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you, Barak, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. On January 8th this year, I stood among thousands of people on Dam Square in Amsterdam. It was one day after the cowardly attack in Paris on the editorial staff of Charlie Hebdo. One day after the cold-blooded murder of 12 innocent people. People around the world were deeply affected by these events. Je suis Charlie, and we said it in Amsterdam too. It was an evening I'll never forget. There we stood, united and resolute. Men and women from all corners of the earth, young and old, people of every religious background. And our message to terrorists was loud and clear. We are different, and yet we are one. We are the majority. And we will not let you divide us. Hands off our freedom were my words that night. And I can still feel the emotion of that moment. Daesh and violent extremism are not other people's problems. Not only are countries like Syria and Iraq being completely destabilized, this threat also spreads insecurity and fuels tensions in our own communities. And that is why the Netherlands is and will remain so actively involved in the fight against Daesh and in combating violent extremism. We have an obligation to help foster international peace and stability, and we cannot take our own freedom for granted. So we stand shoulder to shoulder with many other countries in the region and beyond in the coalition against Daesh. Dutch F-16s are involved in the air campaign against Daesh targets on a daily basis. We have sent military trainers and equipment to Iraq to train the Iraqi army and the Peshmerga. We are also providing emergency aid, implementing counter-messaging strategies and working on capacity building. It is not an easy task, but it is crucial. When people are being beheaded, and ancient heritage sites are being destroyed with sledgehammers, we must respond. And we must respond there where it is happening. A second track the Netherlands is following is prevention. In our own country, we have developed a broad program focusing not only 
on potential foreign terrorist fighters, but on parents, schools, local government and the local police too. If we, if we can give young, often impressionable people the prospect of a good future, they will be less drawn to extremist groups. The idea is that intervening early in their, in their immediate social environment is the best way to stop young people being tempted to go off to fight abroad. Any kind of positive and moderate influence can help. Our approach is inclusive where possible and repressive where necessary. Our international efforts include working with partners in the Global Counterterrorism Forum. The forum is a primary platform where countries can share knowledge and information in order to prevent terrorism. A few days ago, the Netherlands became co-chair of the forum, affirming our long-term commitment. The forum complements and collaborates with the UN and other organizations. Over the past year, there has been a big focus on how to prevent potential foreign terrorist fighters from traveling abroad, and how to deal with those who come back. The fact is that violent extremism and terrorist groups like Daesh, Al-Qaeda, Yabat al-Nusra and Boko Haram are constantly evolving. This is not a static threat and will not simply disappear. The international community cannot afford to sit back. We must be vigilant and persistent. We must continue to make it clear that we are not fighting a religion. We are fighting terrorists who carry out attacks and whose barbarism knows no bounds. For that reason, too, it is good that we are meeting here today. The Netherlands remains fully committed to the task ahead. Freedom is our inspiration, resolve is our weapon, and together we will succeed in pushing back the terrorist threat. Thank you. Next, I'd like to ask His Excellency Prime Minister Dovatulu uh, for his statement. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, I add my voice to the words of appreciation and thanks to President Obama for this much timely initiative, especially when New York is the beating heart of the international public opinion. My country has been the victim of terrorism since early 1970s knows only too well that terrorism is an ugly instrument of illegitimate politics. In the course of this year only, we have been targeted by three terrorist organizations, groups, with different extremist ideologies, namely Daesh, PKK, and DHKPC. In late July, the Daesh attack on civilians in Turkey killed, killed 32 citizens and some security personnel on the border. This was immediately followed by PKK attacks almost in a simultaneous manner with Daesh, and in those attacks we lost even more innocent civilians and security personnel. PKK's con concomitant attacks with Daesh plays a multiplying role on the impact of terrorist threat in our region. Terrorism has no religion, ethnicity, or geography. Terrorist ideology exploiting religion is no different from terrorism exploiting race and ethnicity. There is no difference between Daesh and PKK and other terrorist organizations. Our friends and partners, all of us, must be vigilant. One terrorist fighting the other will not legitimize it. We want our partners and friends to support Turkey in its fight against all type of terrorism. Mr. President, dear colleagues, no child is born to be a killer or a terrorist. The process of radicalization and crossing the not, not so very thin line of supporting use of violence for political purposes is indeed a complex matter. As governments, our responsibility to protect our nations against the fear and violence from terrorism also include protection of our sons and daughters from the extremist ideologists and terrorist masterminds. Due to globalization and the impact of social media on transformation, today the extremist ideologies are viral and the repercussions are global. But nevertheless, the process of radicalization itself involves very personal and local elements. Thus, for every country, society, and even community, we need to develop context-specific measures. In that respect, we welcome the Strong Cities Network, where Turkey is represented by the city of Antalya. Building resilience against violent extremism requires long-term and indiscriminate policies involving whole of government and whole of society. Patience, insight, coordination, consistency, and determination are key words. 
an integral part of our countering violent extremism agenda should be avoid new div dividing lines in our societies. We must pay utmost attention to ensure that violent extremism is not attributed to any ethnic, religious, or sectarian group. Turkey, as the co-chair of Global Counterterrorism Forum, and separately as the co-chair of anti daesh Coalition Working Group on Foreign fight uh, Terrorist Fighters, has been contributing to the debate on countering violent extremism. Unprecedented threat emanating from foreign terrorist fighters in the past few years has only confirmed, confirmed what we fear. Some of these young men and women who have joined Daesh from the very heart of Europe or from countries with predominantly Muslim population are neither poor nor uneducated nor had problems of integration. Yet they end up in the ranks of this vicious terrorist group together with the fringe clusters of petty criminals or sociopaths. Our work in anti-Daesh coalition working group, Global Counterterrorism Forum, or in other fora, should thus be focusing on pull factors as well as push factors. Mr. President, in the no-entry list that my government has introduced against foreign terrorist fighters since 2011, we have now recorded down almost 20,000 names from over 100 countries. Moreover, thanks to the efforts of our risk analysis groups, more than 1,000 suspicious travels, travels were denied entry to Turkey at airports. As such, we prevented a considerable number of foreign terrorist fighters from reaching to conflict zones. Only in 2015, we have deported more than 1,000 foreign nationals with suspicious previous presence in conflict zones in Syria and in Iraq. Dear colleagues, I want to speak aloud. To tackle this problem, we need to act together. Without proper and timely sharing of intelligence and in the absence of measures to address the grievances of young people in host countries, we as a whole will fail in this quest. Our efforts to dismantle networks of recruitment, propaganda, and finance of terrorist groups should continue. On the other hand, let us not deceive ourselves. While the foreign fighters phenomena has made the threat more visible, it is just part of the problem. There is no terrorist group, including Daesh and Nusra or others, that is solely formed by foreign fighters. We cannot ignore the impact of unresolved conflicts, mismanaged crises, mass displacements, and gaps of human security, intolerance, discrimination, racism, xenophobia and Islamophobia as factors that prepare the ground for violent extremism. Syria in, is a case in point. Failure to address the root cause emanating from the heinous and murder regime created a vacuum filled by Daesh, which turned into a pull factor for foreign terrorists from across the world. Mr. President, dear colleagues, as the international community, the best narrative that we have in our disposal against violent extremism abuse is our ability to deliver peace, stability, welfare, and justice. We need to ensure that our deeds meet our commitments and our actions do not fall far from our values. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, next, I would like to ask His Excellency Prime Minister uh, Matteo Renzi for his statement. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for your leadership for this meeting. Uh, this is the largest coalition uh, against terrorism uh, the world has uh, ever seen, bringing together countries from the region uh, around the world. So I think it's a great responsibility. Italy has assured its uh, resolute support uh, to the international coalition against Daesh, Daesh particularly uh, through its carabinieri. Italy is leading the coalition strategic initiative of training hundreds uh, of Iraqi police uh, forces. I think it's very important because uh, this is the signal uh, of a very friendship in, uh, for the citizens, for the women, children, for the families of the uh, Iraqi people. Italy has taken the helm also together with the United States of America and the Saudi uh, Arabia of the counter ISIL finance group and uh, it's very important uh, underlying some of initiatives uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this sector, the new financial san sanction. Uh, the initiative particularly for the restrictive measures also in our country for self-trained uh, jihadist and foreign terrorist fighters, I think this is a particular but uh, very important. And also we are asking coalition partners to focus on external donation in order to prevent terrorist abuse on non-profit organization 
in Europe, a number of large networks of individual recruiting foreign terrorist fighters have been discovered and suppressed in recent months, exactly follow the money trail, as proven never so true and never so useful. This is important for me. Just four brief remarks. First, culture. I'm really surprised because a lot of attacks are against the museum, Bardo, in Tunisia, against uh, Palmyra, against uh, school in Peshawar and in other countries. So culture is our identity. Italy is leading the efforts uh, with UNESCO to defend also this part of, uh, of this field of uh, uh, discussion. Second, religious. And uh, we think uh, Middle, uh, Middle East today is, I, I, I use this expression, today is and not today was, uh, an incredible and uh, unique cultural and social mosaic for every religion. We must defend, particularly in this moment, in, 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 the, in the land in which a lot of religious was born, were born in, in the past. Third, not only Syria, not only Iraqi, but also Africa. Uh, for us, for Italians, obviously, the priority is Libya situation, we know, but also the sub saharan um, situation in Africa, particularly with a uh, Firouge who combine together a lot of different extremists. And for my personal consideration, I, I listened yesterday your consideration, Mr. President, uh, about social network, and I agree, obviously, uh, totally with you. Social network is the place of freedom, is an incredible opportunity, and the people arrive. And I, I very appreciated the words of Barack Obama yesterday about it. Obviously, everyone, uh, is worried for the risks also of social media and social network as a, a way of recruiting uh, of uh, new terrorists, particularly in uh, our continent, in Europe, in which uh, self-trained jihadists uh, uh, decide to uh, make some in, in intervention and terrorist attack exactly with this uh, approach. But I think it's very interesting, uh, your initiative um, as United States and the United Nations, because uh, uh, the risk for a politician, this is my point of view, is to reduce in the time, in the, in, in the season of social network, in the season of old news, in the season of the uh, dominance of uh, a newspaper and the social media, to reduce our vision to all the news, the last news, the last, the, 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 the last press agency, the risk to approach this great uh, question without a comprehensive and say, a global approach. I think your initiative of today it's particularly important because uh, help us uh, to have an approach not only focused on the last event of the last news of the uh, last question in the uh, TV, in the old news, but we have a strategy and a vision. And I think this is absolutely crucial because the largest coalition around the world must win this battle. So I wish to offer to President Obama Italy support to an international counterterrorism clearinghouse mechanism, and uh, we are absolutely sure we will prevail and defeat uh, Daesh's evil projects. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, I think you've heard from a, a cross section of the coalition. Uh, and uh, the unity of vision, uh, but also the various capacities and elements that are going to be involved in us being successful in this process. Uh, at this stage, uh, I've asked uh, my Vice President, uh, Vice President Biden, uh, accompanied by my Attorney General Loretta Lynch and our uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, uh, to chair the remainder of the ISIL discussion as well as the foreign fighter encountering violent extremism sessions. Uh, I asked them to be here today because along with those seated next to me, they're the leaders in our effort to disrupt foreign terrorist fighters and counter violent extremism. Uh, they've worked with many of you uh, on a whole range of these issues. They lead different parts of our government, but they work closely together demonstrating how well, uh, we as leaders must work across bureaucratic and international boundaries to break 
the entire life cycle of terrorism, from radicalization. And I thought that uh, David Cameron's point was excellent, that uh, we are focused on violent extremism, but uh, violent extremism is emerging out of uh, an extremist worldview that has to be counteracted, uh, all the way through conflict zones and bringing about the sort of good governance and political settlements that are required so that we don't have incubators for uh, expressions of violent extremism uh, to uh, the work that has to be done militarily uh, to counter activities that are going on right now in places like Iraq. So uh, I want to very much thank all the leaders and participants here today, including those non-governmental organizations uh, that are participating. I'm now going to turn uh, the chair over to Vice President uh, Biden for the remainder of the summit. Thank you very much for your participation.